Okay, okay, so I'll get started then. Uh, yeah. Is it? Are you okay if I minimize this, uh, Jenny? Yeah. Can I minimize this? I don't need to see my the room. Is that uh, okay? No, no, no. Okay. Uh, there was oh, the there it is over there. Okay. Yeah. Thank so, you, Carol. Thank you. Yes, absolutely. So the the title of my talk is on emerging evidence uh, for the management of diverticulitis, and. Um, I was asking Prof. Art, how often do you see diverticulitis? And he told me it's mostly a Western disease. So bear with me then, because um, it's a topic that it's pretty hotly contested because there's a lot of um, changes in the paradigms of management, medical and surgical management. I have no disclosures regarding this talk. And uh, the way I structure the talk was to first touch upon etiology medical management and then go uh, to our surgical management for uncomplicated and complicated disease and uh, possible future directions. So what we're seeing really in, in the Western countries, a significant increase in the incidence of this disease. Um, needless to say, uh, a third of the colectomies we do are because of diverticular disease, particularly in the United States. And, um, and the rate of the disease going up, we think it has to do a lot with the environment. And when I say environment, I don't only mean diet, but also lifestyle and, and a little bit of hereditary. Now we have an appreciation that it has some hereditary component. And interesting enough, when we talk about diverticular disease and diverticulitis, the inflammation of that diverticula, um, a lot of times it may present as a colitic disease, like almost um, parallel to an inflammatory bowel disease. And also what we see a lot of the uh, gut innervation to be changing according to the, with it, because of the inflammation, and start seeing um, irritable bowel syndrome and motility disorders. So it's very common to see patients that have suffered from recurrent diverticulitis presenting with irritable bowel syndrome that you don't treat as they are inflamed actually at the time. And we have divided, this is the one thing that has stayed stable in how we understand the disease. We call it uncomplicated when you don't see uh, necessarily an abscess, when you don't see a fistula or a stricture versus complicated. One would argue on the screen on the left where you see the very, um, uh, the further up on the left, when I see a diverticular uh, flare to that extent, it's interesting that that will call uncomplicated. It's pretty um, inflamed colon and highly unlikely that it will resolve on its own. However, that would be still uncomplicated where you see on the right on the screen, the colovesicular fistula with air in the bladder in the upper uh, right side, in the right side, as well on the lower part, you will see um, a diverticular abscess. So that's what would be a complicated diverticular disease. And when we wanted to, um, according to the CAT scan, we can, because almost every patient with diverticulitis will be imaged. Uh, when do we call it moderate versus severe? Moderate when you see uh, just the phlegmon, uh, which is inflammation of the pericolic fat, and uh, severe when you see the abscess, when you see the communication with the bladder. And of course, with moderate, you will see that um, only 4% will fail medical management, whereas when it's severe, 26% will fail medical management, and eventually they will need um, an operation. And in also in the States, because I also scope, and I frequently, when I do the colonoscopy, I have to tell you, it's rare that I will find a patient over 50 years of age without the presence of diverticula, like um, rare. And uh, it's it's very, um, I get impressed. I even will share with the patient, I did not see any diverticula in your colon because it's so very common. And we used to believe that the presence of diverticula, which is diverticulosis, will lead to diverticulitis in a high percentage. And we know that's a myth now. The most recent data um, will call for one to 4% evidence of diverticulitis with uh, diverticulitis for patients that have diverticula.
And the way we understood it, and that is has not truly changed, is that uh, we thought that it was secondary to our poor diets, at least in Western countries, where we um, really consume high amounts of red meat, processed and unprocessed, and not so much of vegetables, fruit, and overall fiber. And um, we are we were basing those studies on it um, that we had in the 80s and 90s, we had big nurse and nurse health population studies, and we studied a lot of different things, cardiac disease, colonic diseases, and one of them was diverticulitis. And we had found that it was inversely related to the amount of fiber they were consuming the incidence of diverticulitis. Now, diverticular is a structural abnormality. It's that herniation in the colonic wall, which is usually anti-mesenteric. Now, of course, we see it also mesenteric. And we thought that it had to do with the older population, although we're finding out that younger and younger people are getting it. Um, it's not uncommon, actually, to see um, patients age uh, 30 to present with an acute flare of diverticular disease. And genetics, when before we did not um, understand it, we know it's familial. Actually, there are twin studies that show identical twins with a three times risk. If one twin had diverticulitis three times higher than the general population, the other twin will develop diverticulitis as well. And there is the there are a couple of genes, the TNFS15 you see here, and a couple of others that code for elastin and laminin. Um, those are the genes that we see in single nucleotide polymorphism in those genes that we attribute the diverticular attacks. And this is the health professional study that I mentioned to you. These are from the 80s all the way to the early 2000s. And they actually found that it's in the incidence of diverticulosis was inversely related to fiber, uh, to the amount of fiber intake. And actually, we used to think that it was not in popcorn. It was a myth. Uh, clearly has nothing to do with diverticular disease. In, in particular, there was one study 2014 that was published that um, actually 2011 and then another one in 2015 that published that it said it was a seasonal disease because we see an incidence of diverticulitis much higher in the summer than we see it in the rest of the seasons. And I think it has to do probably with dehydration and not eating right. However, um, not truly um, know why the etiology would be. Uh, the other very interesting study, because I do believe that it has to do the microbiome, the gut bacteria that will cause the flare. Um, they, they, this study came out from uh, Lehi Clinic um, that uh, showed that uh, with um, uh, patients that had appendicitis and they had an appendectomy in their past, there were much higher incidence of developing in later age diverticulitis, which makes me think if you think of the fecalis, the appendicitis, the inflammation, again, of a diverticulum, kind of longer for the appendix, but still kind of the same baseline in seeing the incidence of diverticulitis that makes you think that it has to do a little bit with the microbiome and the gut bacteria. So now the way we understand the disease is that the etiology, it's not one thing. It's not just the diet. It's the diet, it's the genetics, it's the lifestyle. I should mention here for the lifestyle, smoking and obesity. Obesity, actually, the studies are kind of split in half. Some support that high BMI, higher risk for incidence of diverticulitis, and some others do not support it. But smoking medications, particularly NSAIDs, have been associated with increased risk in incidence for diverticular disease. And when it comes to which cytokines we find, you won't be surprised. There are the cytokines we find in any inflammatory disease, elevated CRP, elevated TNF-alpha, and elevated IL-6. Um, this uh, schema, I should say, it's from a review article um, one of our residents at OHSU wrote with us. So you'll see a few of her graphs uh, from this review um, on the slides. So how have we changed the paradigm of treatment for uncomplicated diverticulitis. And again, uncomplicated, just a phlegmon. So this trial actually, um, it's not a, a recent trial. It was 2011, the very first article that came out from the AVO trial, Scandinavian trial, uh, came out in 2012, where they it was a multi-center trial. 
and they have they examined if they took a population of patients with uncomplicated diverticulitis and they treat them with antibiotics versus no antibiotics but bowel rest they kind of found that they did not see significant changes in their recurrence in leading to surgery in morbidity or quality of life the same trial looked at the results in more longer term, like more longitudinally, and it came out, that study came out, published in 2019, and they continued saying that for uncomplicated diverticulitis, the need for antibiotics should be questioned. They were not finding that antibiotics added anything to the treatment. And then after, that was a study from the Netherlands, as I mentioned, and the secondary, the primary endpoint was the time to recovery, but then they looked also about the chances for surgery, mortality, length of stay in the hospital, and so forth. And uh, the only thing, of course, they saw is with the, the patients that received antibiotics stayed longer in the hospital. Well, that doesn't uh, surprise us uh, because you needed to continue with the treatment. But they didn't see any changes when it comes to the things we care about, like how they recovered and if they needed surgery in the end. So um, that was the biggest trial that starts supporting, saying that we don't need to really offer uh, you know, antibiotics. And actually, between that time frame from 2011 to 2019, a lot of other studies came out. Instead of antibiotics, what else can we do? Fiber, um, treat the, the symptoms of the spastic colon, as we say, the antispasmodics that we use, mesalamine, which is kind of the food of the colonocyte, or probiotics. And actually, the, tri the studies, because there were not trials, on rifaximin. I don't know how often you use rifaximin here in Thailand. Rifaximin, which is the, the brand name is Ifaxan in the States, it's a very expensive antibiotic like for two week treatment is $550. It's cost prohibitive. Where in Europe, Zifaxan is used very often and it's very inexpensive as well as in Canada. So the rifaximin actually studies that have been done is mostly to, you give it to the patient, not so much to treat the diverticular disease, but to decrease the incidence of a recurrent diverticulitis. And of course, because this is not randomized trials, you cannot say that this is a dogma or paradigm of care, but I have to say personally, I have used rifaximin for my patients that come with uncomplicated diverticulitis that I treat with bowel rest, and then I give them a course of rifaximin just to decrease the incidence of recurrent of their diverticular disease. And, you know, again, an old dogma that we had was that everybody who gets diverticulitis, as soon as they cool off, you should get a colonoscopy because God forbid you miss the cancer that they may have. That kind of knee jerk kind of response, like diverticulitis, six to eight weeks colonoscopy, we have really veered away from it. Uh, really what we do now is if they don't have a recent colonoscopy or if they're very young, like in their 30s, then they will get a colonoscopy, but not necessarily because they had a diverticular attack. And actually, most of the studies support that now. I'm saying when they're very young because we're seeing an incidence of the rectosigmoid cancer. And you don't want to miss, because of a diverticular flare, a young patient and say, oh, they're too young, let's not do a colonoscopy. So in the States, more likely they will get a colonoscopy if they have not had a recent colonoscopy. And what I mean by that, one, two years prior, the incident of the diverticular disease. So the next thing about the uncomplicated diverticulitis was what were the indications for elective surgery? And oh my God, we went uh, from one attack to surgery, two attacks to surgery. Every time you get an attack, uh, you know, you increase the risk for this, the, the subsequent attack, you better go into surgery. And now we have completely like changed that and we tailor it to the patient. The two only things I should mention, and you'll see it later in my slides, when one patient presents to me with multiple attacks within one year, and what I mean by multiple, when there are more than three attacks within a year, in my mind, two things come up. I never killed the disease, so there is a smoldering diverticular disease that I never treated completely, completely either with the antibiotics or bowel rest, or for whatever reason, they're predisposed. So this is a patient that kind of gave, gave away their um, predisposition. 
and then more likely I will offer an elective colectomy. And of course, when it comes to complicated diverticulitis, most of the patients with when they um, come to us with complicated diverticulitis, even when the active inflammation subsides, very likely we're going to lead to a surgery because they will have either a fistula or a stricture that you need to address anyway. So um, with those with those complicated diverticular cases, surgery is not so much a question um, as it is with uncomplicated diverticulitis. And when I'm saying those things like how our paradigms of care change, I, I love this, although it's not um, the most recent, like it's from 2014, uh, the international guidelines, you look at the level of evidence you have for everything you practice. And if you see here, everything that we use when it comes to diverticular disease, from clinical diagnosis, the accuracy of CT, the risk factors, and you see what is the level of evidence that we preach to our students, our trainees, to our peers. And if you see where we have really 1A and 1B level of evidence, it's only on very few of those, um, you know, um, how can I say, uh, factors that really contribute to how we um, formulate and implement our care. So clearly the data is everywhere and truly there are only a couple of things that are very well tested. That's why it's still a subject that it's so hotly contested. So they say study the past if you would like to define the future and that was Confucius and that's really how we are changing our guidelines. So the elective resection after two attacks to complicated diverticulitis right away, we have changed quite a bit since then. And the way that, uh, as I mentioned, like we are waiting for how many attacks is really the attacks. Usually now we're saying three attacks within one year is usually when we continue uh, for uncomplicated, to, uh, for a complicated diverticulitis to surgery and complicated, um, usually the end to get surgery and how often our guidelines have changed. This is the clinical practice parameters, the, cl the clinical practice guidelines that you can find in the diseases of colon and rectum. And this is the most recent one that um, we have in DCR, which is kind of our, uh, how can I say, a professional journal for colorectal surgeons for the states. Uh, 2020 were the latest guidelines, and there was not a lot of difference from uh, 2014. Um, the biggest differences was on the antibiotics for uncomplicated diverticulitis and laparoscopic lavage, where in 2014 kind of we favored it, and you'll see in 2020 we're not favoring as much the laparoscopic lavage for complicated diverticulitis. So the decision to recommend elective sigmoid colectomy in 2020 needs to be tailored to the patient. And the decision on elective resection um, should be also based to the patient is also by the guidelines of Great Britain and Ireland. This is from the ACPGBI. So who needs an operation? I, I mentioned to you my personal bias about three attacks per year. And, um, and then uh, where we are with complicated diverticulitis. So I'm going to go over here in this slide. So this is what we have found. When you have somebody who presents with you with uncomplicated diverticulitis as a surgeon, what you want to avoid or you want to predict, what is it with the next attack that will get an urgent resection? Or with the next, you know, what will be the likelihood of getting an elective resection? Or what will be the likelihood of getting another attack? This is what you're trying to predict. So this is a study that came out from in JAMA Surgery 2016 from one of our colorectal colleagues up uh, in Washington that found out that with the first attack, 4.3% will get an urgent resection, elective resection about a third. Most of them will get an anastomosis. And actually, 57% um, or 56%, you could say, they had um, surgery after three episodes. And I have to say, although this was published, still if you ask colorectal surgeons along the country, you'll see different biases because our guidelines are allowing us to tailor it to the patient. And of course, you're tailoring it to the gestalt of the surgeon that, you know, the advice will be asked from. So um, another study that came from uh, Dr. Hall um, and actually a couple of them, and it's not just Dr. Hall, but I will talk about that, is 
uncomplicated diverticulitis, the risk of a stoma you see here from the study in archives of surgery, that was very early, 2005, both of them. You saw here that it was one out of 2,000 patients needed an, you know, um, a surgery. Perforation from the first attack, 25%, second attack, 12%. This is where the dog, not the dogma, the shifted paradigm, the change in our paradigm of care was that we, we believed that exponentially you increase the risk of the next attack by having many attacks. And we're finding here that that's not the case, but also the next attack is not going to be as severe as the first attack, as you see here from the study in 2011. So the one thing I have to say that I wanted to bring here as a discussion point, the rules are a little bit different for patients that have high comorbidities or they're immunosuppressed. And when I say immunosuppressed patients, like people think, oh, you know, maybe they have AIDS, but that's not true. Our diabetic patients are immunosuppressed and we have a lot of them. Uh, chronic renal failure patients are immunosuppressed. Uh, collagen vascular disease, it's I consider immunosuppressed and those patients show to have a much higher fold increase in perforation even with one attack, which is not true for the average population. So this was another study where it really took different groups for different reasons for their immunosuppression, steroid use, transplant patients, you know, they're immunosuppressed, P patients that have cancer history, chronic urinary failure and other, and really what they found is that um, they, um, excuse me, I should uh, hear what they found is that with their first attack, they had higher risk for perforation. And uh, in this study, again, with immunosuppression and diverticulitis, a population of 192 patients, you see here that the ones that they presented with for emergency surgery, like the hyperitoneal signs, the, more, the mortality was very high, 31%. Uh, the patients that did not receive surgery, but they were not the ones that presented with peritonitis. So the study, uh, one would say that is a little bit biased, but the ones that did not present with the peritonitis, they didn't need surgery. They, of course, they, their mortality was lower. However, their, their risk for recurrence was higher. So that's uncomplicated diverticular disease. And now we're moving a little bit more to the, um, uh, how an uncomplicated disease linear progresses to a complicated disease. Because you could think that somebody who presents to you with two, three, four attacks of uncomplicated diverticulitis, just a phlegmon, do they have high likelihood of becoming, coming back to you with complicated disease? Stricture, fistula, abscess. So these are the studies that kind of just showed that it doesn't hold true. Like somebody can present multiple times with uncomplicated diverticulitis, and it doesn't mean that they will present a few years down the line with a complicated incident of diverticulitis. And it was really Chapman, who was a fellow actually where I trained that published the big study in 2006, where it says multiple attacks, risk, risk, less risk of complicated diverticulitis. However, if you ask our patients and you could tell them how badly are you affected, they will tell you they're affected a lot. So even if we as physician, we have the warped reality, or it's not complicated disease, but if they come with a lot of, a lot of episodes of uncomplicated diverticulitis, they're miserable. They're still miserable. Their quality of life is not high. And that's how we decide to tailor it to that patient with the multiple attacks. And I decide to offer them a colectomy. So what we've learned after two attacks, should we offer a section? Most of the studies will say no. Does it increase the um, uh, chances of developing complicated disease? No. Does it increase the risk of uh, perforation that you end up with an urgent colostomy? No. With the immunocompromised, I still have to say, despite a lot of even our guidelines in 2020, they say even with your immunocompromised patient, if you have an uncomplicated diverticulitis, you should tailor it to that patient. I personally, I get more nervous. I am more like wanting to offer colectomy and I have this discussion with the patient. And then of course, recurrent attacks, ongoing symptoms, um, smoldering diverticulitis and immunosuppression like chronic renal failure, I would offer colectomy.
This is another study again by Hall and all by from Leahy Clinic that they did uh, the first event uh, diverticulitis, just uncomplicated first episode, and they found that the ones that um, had recurrence, higher recurrence risk, were the ones that presented with complicated disease, retroperitoneal abscess, a segment more than five centimeters. But you see here, family history also probably led to a higher risk for recurrence, and a right colonic disease was not highly associated. We don't see so much right colonic diverticular disease in Western, you know, Western countries. Uh, however, I have to tell you, I've seen hepatic flexure, so you would say that's right colon. I've seen transverse colon, and I've seen splenic flexure. The disease is definitely changing its face, its phenotype, from the classic sigmoid that we used to see diverticular disease, and now we're seeing it in many different areas of the left side, and I have seen it in transverse colon and hepatic flexure. So I, I kind of touched upon, um, I have an echo and I, I don't know what I'm doing wrong. So the, the two big trials, I should, should I take this away? That's it? Okay, thank you. Can I? Can you hear me okay? Yeah, okay. So the, I should mention that there are two big trials on elective operative management of diverticulitis, the direct trial and the laser trial. So the, needless to say also, the best trials for diverticular disease in Scandinavian populations, or I should say Northern European populations. So you'll see the direct trial and the laser trial, uh, direct from Netherlands, laser from Finland, uh, kind of very similar trials uh, that um, they, t they talked about um, about surgery when it comes, what is best, like do the surgery, the elective surgery, and what their primary endpoint was quality of life. And interesting um, enough, uh, they found in both trials two different populations, but again, one would say Northern European, uh, that the quality of life was better um, for elective uh, colectomy and uh, significant higher quality of life. So this as a surgeon makes you happy, but um, anyway, but again, uh, they had of course higher morbidity in the surgical group, which makes sense. If you offer surgery, you may have complications, you're gonna have some morbidity versus the observation group. And those two trials in my mind are kind of showing the same, the same thing um, and pretty similar in time. When it comes to complicated diverticulitis, again, we mentioned what is a complicated diverticulitis, but also under that umbrella, we include the perforated diverticular disease, and you can have Hinchy 4, you know, Hinchy 3 or Hinchy 4. Hinchy 3, we often call the purulent peritonitis, versus Hinchy 4 is the fecal peritonitis. And it's interesting that a radiologist called this. Although, you know, it's purulent versus fecal, a lot of times you need to explore a patient to know if there is a lot of difference. And um, I will uh, talk a little bit about this. So which are the indications for resections for those patients? Personally, when they get to complicated diverticulitis, because the risk of recurrence is very high, I, I tend to offer surgery. And here I wanted to again bring up the point that we see the verticular now in our colonoscopies throughout the colon. It's not like how we used to see it. So it's not uncommon for me to see diverticular disease and splenic flexure, transverse colon and so forth. That changes a little bit the surgery because before our dogma was that if it's in the sigmoid colon, you need to bring it all the way down to the rectum. So you decrease the risk of recurrence when you do your colectomy, your distal transection point had to be to the rectum. But now when I see diverticular disease up in the splenic flexure, or transverse colon, you can imagine that does not carry through. So I, I usually do a segmental colectomy. Nothing yet has been published about that, but among the four colorectal surgeons at OHSU, we often have this discussion that a lot of the dogma of what is the right surgery has changed. So here, kind of the images that I mentioned, um, you see the fistula, you see the air in the bladder, the classic diagrams you see in all the textbooks, and the ugly pictures you see when you do a colonoscopy with a stricture. So um, a lot of times in complicated diverticulitis, when our patients present, they present with an abscess. The abscess can be paracolic, pelvic, mesenteric, you know, or 
you know, um, anti-mesenteric. Bottom line, we still follow the very old uh, criteria of Ambrosetti, the study that was published in 2005. And what we know also, which means five centimeters and above, you put a drain. Less than five centimeters, some radiologists are very good. They will do a CT guided drainage. If it's three centimeters, you cannot drain that abscess. You'll give them IV antibiotics and admit that patient. And we also have learned from that study, from the Amprosetti study, that when you have a pelvic abscess, the risk for recurrence is high and the likelihood of needing surgery is much higher. So this is kind of the studies that support what I mentioned. And uh, this is the Amprosetti intestinal colon, which is a, you know, a landmark study and actually still kind of holds true when a lot of the other studies, uh, I would say, we are changing our, our paradigm and the way we understand the disease. And um, when it comes to abscess, again, pelvic abscess, much higher risk for an operation that they're going to need an operation. In both of those uh, studies, although they concluded something completely different, um, you will see that, like in this one, it says that if you have an abscess, 42%, no late operations, conclusion observation is safe, like drain the abscess or give IV antibiotics, where here they said require colectomy. Truly here, the, the differences were where the abscess was located. Uh, paracolic versus pelvic. So um, what we tend to do, we'll drain, we'll quiet the disease down, we say, we'll treat it with antibiotics, and very likely we'll offer um, an elective colectomy on a later date. So although I'm telling you a lot of my biases and my dogmas, what have the trials shown? And here is a table again that we published, we put it all together about what the trials have shown about um, surgery and complicated diverticulitis. So there was a big trial, the ladies trial that has been published, the multiple arms of the ladies trial has been published in different times from 2011 to 2021. So truly the, the arm of the ladies trial, the DIVA, and uh, was the one that actually kind of stopped the era that when you have a complicated diverticular disease with microperforation or even with perforation, you, like free perforation, you don't need to do a Hartman procedure. Actually, the DIVA arm, uh, it was called to be the death of the Hartman pouch. Um, and what they found was that you can do a primary anastomosis Either you divert the patient and the quality of life is much better. And actually, compared to the patients that received a Hartman, the likelihood of the ones that received Hartman, the likelihood of, of reversing that colostomy was much lower than reversing the diverting lupuleostomy when the arm of the primary anastomosis had a diversion that was more likely to be closed. So actually, this was probably one of the better arms of the ladies' trial. Um, the other arm of the ladies' trial was about laparoscopic lavage. And as I mentioned to you, just as of 2018, if you look at clinical guidelines, there was a role for laparoscopic lavage. We don't recommend it. We don't do it anymore. Why? Because we have found that patients that receive laparoscopic lavage, they end up needing a colectomy. It may acutely make somebody feel better, but you have not taken away the culprit and uh, the morbidity actually is much higher. So although the Lola um, arm just kind of ter was ter uh, termi uh, terminated early because they found that uh, the lavage group was not superior to colectomy. Um, and actually the uh, Dilala also trial showed that laparoscopic lavage should not be um, practiced. The only trial that came and said, do laparoscopic um, uh, lavage was the Scandiv uh, Scandinavians uh, here, uh, Sweden and Norway in 2015, that said, you know what, people don't need surgery. If you do a laparoscopic lavage and you give them antibiotics, they don't need surgery. But we have not found that this is really holding true. So you'll see in our guidelines in 2020, so 2018 to 2020, and that is one of the biggest differences in our clinical practice guidelines. So needless to say, 
um, we showed that uh, in, in a randomized clinical trial that it's much better to do a primary anastomosis, even with peritonitis, with a diverting lupuleostomy versus a Hartman's procedure. And then a lot of systematic reviews came up. So in my slides, I have included a lot of the systematic reviews that kind of support it. So uh, this is another study, again, that kind of supports that you should do primary anastomosis with ileostomy. Now, personally, what I do, so I, I consider that to me, I ask my anesthesiologist, are we on pressors? We're not on pressors. I, how bad is my fecal contamination? Do the two ends of the colon look healthy? I will put them back together. If they say, hey, Dr. T, pressors are up. If the inflammation in either part is high, then I won't put them back together. So here you see this in this trial where they said about primary anastomosis heart pump procedure, but it's really the gestalt of the surgeon. Um, if they have even fecal and peritonitis, but they're doing well and healthy colon and rectum, then I will do a primary anastomosis. So uh, this is the same trial that kind of supports the uh, um, a primary anastomosis as the direct trial. And then I mentioned the lap lavage trials. We're going away from lap lavage, but this is what um, uh, we are not supporting anymore. This is pretty complex, um, but I thought that I'll share with you. It's kind of a summary of everything I discussed. So uncomplicated diverticulitis, no antibiotics, bowel rest. Bowel rest is key. And then I personally will give them rifaximin. And Brita can talk to you how we order it from Canada, which is much cheaper than the United States for our patients and how uh, we try to do that because I mentioned how expensive it is in the States. Uh, for the complicated diverticulitis, if they have an abscess, we'll drain more than five centimeters. Again, the prosthetic criteria, uh, I think I, I kind of follow still since 2005, it still kind of holds true quiet them down, and very likely um, they will get an elective colectomy. Not that you have to give them an elective colectomy. And as I said, the studies show if it's a pelvic abscess, much higher chance of getting an elective colectomy. And then, of course, when it's complicated because they have articulitis with a fistula stricture, obstruction, and so forth, that needs surgery as well. So this is kind of a summary of everything I kind of mentioned before. So I am actually extremely excited about future directions because I kind of mentioned the genetic factors. I do believe I have inherited my gut microbiome from my mom and my dad, and I've given mine to my son. And I and yes, um, it, it is. It's not a tabula rasa. I think we start with somewhere, and then of course it's environmental with what we put in our mouth. If we smoke, if we smoke, if we drink, if we travel, and so forth. However, I think there is a genetic component, even the bacterial, uh, you know, that we have inherited. Uh, so I am excited about those studies, learning more about this and how possibly we could prevent it from happening in the in for our future generations, for our you know kids. And with that, I'm going to say thank you, and I'll receive any questions. And you can have the slides and the review I used. I have it here. It's a review I wrote uh, with a couple of our residents, so I'm happy to answer any questions.